So we're here at the Zafaria Junction Community Gardens. Is yep. that it? With Danielle, the Green Pea Gardener, Instagram. And she's gonna show us her plot and we're gonna talk plants and learn about what she's got going on. How long have you been community gardening? Yeah, I've been with Long Beach Organic, which is the organization who um, runs this garden here for, I think three or four years. Um, and they've been, uh, they've been active in the community of Long Beach for quite a while. Um, I wanna say like closest to 10 years, but I wouldn't quote me on that. <laughs> This, is, this garden's been here for about four. Um, it's their biggest garden, um, definitely one of the largest community gardens in Long Beach, and it's really nice. It's such, a, it's such an oasis being in the middle here, and my plot's kind of in the middle. It's nice and quiet. You don't get that very often in the city. We have on, um, right there, we have compost for everybody. We have another one over on the other end of the garden, too. Nice. Um, it's all shareable, and then we have mulch over here. Everybody. Nice. Um, over there is the charity garden. All of the gardeners are donating their own produce to students at Cal State Long Beach. Nice. So there's like a lot of food donation going on here. Awesome. Um, which is really nice. No fall, dragon fruit in the back. Looks like some bush beans, pole beans. That sugar cane, bananas. Yeah, all kinds of stuff. Some kind of spinach, maybe. Kale, chard, peppers, beans. Uh, maybe artichokes. Yeah, lots of artichokes. In here. Nice. Uh, maybe collards or Brussels sprouts. Some kind of squash. Bunch of uh, sort of sunflowers. Yeah, one of the benefits and sometimes difficulties in the community garden is if somebody has something that really loves this climate and it goes to flower, you'll probably get it too. Right. <laughs> so sometimes that really works out. Like, um, you know, volunteers are, I think, the best way to garden if you want to do so, like I was telling you, with, with little effort because a, vol a healthy volunteer yeah. is always going to do better yeah, because so it's are, picked where it's wanted to go. Wanted to go. So what are uh, some volunteers that are beneficial around here? Like uh, dandelion greens, okay, let's go this way. Uh, amaranth. Oh yeah, amaranth, super easy to grow. Um, you'll see a ton of fennel around here. Fennel, Fennel's yes. Fennel's really easy to grow. Yes, wild fennel all over mm -hmm. California. Really and tasty. Then, um, artichokes again. Artichokes That's do really well. That's been my favorite volunteer in my garden. Okay. You'll see. I have been. This is not mine. This is mine. I've been nice. giving it very little love lately. So it's I'm gonna the, talk to you the about the Nopal garden. A little love garden. Nice. It used to be very very loved, but um, yeah. So my garden has experienced a, a real lack of love. Real the lack last of love. Year. Um, the volunteer artichoke over there. Some yeah. Nice kale. So I will show you some of the things that are doing okay, and this is a testament to how easy it is to grow those things. Got you. Um, obviously, you see my cactus is taking over. That's yeah. become quite an issue for me. Hey, let's but have a, a barbecue. Yeah. <laughs> right. It's great food. The only exactly. pro problem that I've had, if you let it go too much, one thing you should do is like clean off the flowers because once there's too many flowers, like I'm having a problem right now, the little pricklies get everywhere mm. and it makes it really hard to wash them well enough to get all of them off because they're so, so small. Okay. So if you're going to grow nopales, it's like best if you pick off these little ones and I'm actually going to put some gloves on just in case because um, and also I found rubber gloves these are like the only gloves that work with these cactus really yeah any other type the little um, uh, what do you call them um, little stickers yeah I'm going blank on what the name is Spines. but they're on the flowers here they're really okay. really small yeah right a little um, micro yeah, I'm going blank on what they're called right now, but um, I'm they, just gonna keep making them names. And so yeah, they, <laughs> they're called. There's a name for it, but they they get embedded in any kind of fabric, yes. even right. even leather. It'll like get through there. But these I found are the best, the latex okay. gloves. Wow. So um, yeah, so it's best to take like these ones. 
these ones are gonna be the most tender. Anything that doesn't have a flower on it. Right. Once it has a flower, it's usually like pretty tough. And then also you run the risk of these little guys. Okay, so do you clear those off before you said? How yeah, you, so- How um, do you keep those down? Yeah, I, w I would just say in general, this is way too overgrown. So it's a good example of like what not to do. Um, but this cactus here has been so happy. Um, Obviously, it's really happy. I yeah. actually really chopped it down recently, and so it came back like gangbusters. Nice. So these ones are good, and you can just twist them off, and that's the best way to take them off. And if you want to propagate them, that's the best way because you get um, right down there. Like wow. any kind of succulent that you want to propagate, you always want to pull it off at that um, right. nodule wherever it connects. And then do you just stick it straight in the ground? Do you let it dry for a little bit before you stick it in? Or? Actually, the way that I got these is I just stuck them right in. Just stick like them this. right in. Yeah. And that was it. Um, <laughs> so it. like really no effort just at all. Just jammed them right in the soil. Yeah. And I, I wasn't sure where it would like it the best. So I put one in each corner. Uh, these three corners so you can see which one which corner corner did the best because it got the least amount of water So Nepal is a perfect if you don't want to water um, That that little one over there gets the most water in the most shade mm. and So it stayed the smallest so the most Sun and the least water. Yeah, and right now this rosemary has died, but it's Together they live for about two years very symbiotically Really? I think what yeah, I think what nice. happened is the cactus got too overgrown. Okay. But um, rosemary and cactus go very well together in general. Nice. How do they help each other? Or? They just want the same amount of everything. Got you. Yeah. Got so you. Same so place. planting them together was like perfect. Yeah. So I guess not symbiotically, but no, you that know, makes sense. You can have. They were kind of like low effort desert kind of plants. Yeah, it's like you know going on the idea of permaculture things that are just going to do well together naturally. Yeah. Right. Um, and then you can see other volunteers that I have here. This is this was artichokes. love it here. Yeah, so this is where I got my first artichoke, and I wasn't sure what to expect. And then, within a few months, I already had artichokes growing. Wow. Yeah, and since then, I just leave it. It grows again. It reseeds. It just keeps coming back. So it's already had about three or four cycles. Nice. And then I just popped up over there too. Right. And that one is on its second cycle as well. Volunteer. Volunteer. And then all this fennel. Um, wow, that's all wild all, fennel. Yeah, that you will. You smell it through the mask. Right. Yeah, so once it gets like here, it's perfect to just pull the seeds out. These are a little bit, um, you know, past the point where you'd want to collect them because it Can looks like a lot are popped open. So we couldn't seed them. Plant. I think a lot of these have already seeded. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, it looks like because they're pretty. They popped open. Yeah, so let me see. Um, these. Like, you kind of want to get them right after this greenish point. This is like a good point to seed them um, when they're like still kind of plump and green. And what I'll do is like right around this stage or when it gets a little bit drier, but not this dry, um, to collect them, I just do that and just pull it straight off and then you get all the seeds like that. Nice. If you plant fennel, like one, yeah. you will never be without fennel again. Nice. <laughs> yeah, you'll see awesome. it's like everywhere in the garden is definitely one of those things you got to take care of. Um, in the sense of you got to cut it down and right. use you it. Right, you got to eat it. Yeah. Which I don't mind at all. Right. So those Grilled, are... Grilled, baked, fennel's great. Yeah, you know, um, what my favorite thing is drinking the tea, drinking tea with the greens. Nice. Yeah, I, okay. um, I'm not, I have to say I'm not like a huge fan of fennel, which is funny because I have so much, but I really like the greens. Uh, nice. And okay. the seeds, and I cook with the seeds a lot, more okay. than the actual bulb itself. Nice. What do you put the seeds in? Uh, I, I just use them like with whatever seasoning when I'm doing like vegetables. I usually use yeah. a mixture of thyme and, um, and fennel and that, that because I'm a vegetarian so it like gives yeah. a little bit more of that savory flavor and yeah. it's great in like pasta sauces and anything Italian. Yeah, yeah it kind of almost gives it a little bit of a sausage like not whatever you get from that, that savory one exactly. or something. It adds it in there. I've definitely noticed that. Yeah, like it's really popular in a lot of um, Italian dishes. So yeah. to me, it really replaces that 
definitely like the sausage Italian sausage has like um, a lot of anise in it which is really right. similar flavor or fennel and right. um, yeah so it gives it that flavor too so okay, this is right if you want to grow food easily here nopales which are great and fennel which is also great these tomatoes look like they're doing really well as well which is and funny the kale is killing it too yeah so another good example of um i've probably only watered this garden once um in the last six months which makes me really sad but I'm going through a master's program That's right amazing, now, though. so it's you, like you literally did an experiment that helps us know what can grow in total neglect. So exactly. This is so useful. Like, this yeah. Is so I'm happy to help. Yes, of <laughs> course. Thank you. Yeah. So these tomatoes, I planted them um, and then never watered them. I watered them once, like two weeks ago. They look rich. Yeah, they're really. They so really the like other thing I would say um, that really, really helped is the first few years that I had the garden, I took care of the soil. And that is like, that will do it. Nice. If you put a lot of effort in at the beginning to your soil and you replace the compost once in a while, it will produce for you. So what did you, what, what did you do to your soil for the first couple of years? What was your regimen or how did you build it? How did you architect it? So um, I actually moved a few times my garden because the first spot that I um, gardened with Long Beach Organic, um, the plot ended, or the um, property owners ended up taking it back. So we had to move, went to another spot that was small and then finally came here. So when I came here, I was like, okay, this time, doing it serious so I built this thing which was very helpful right now it's empty but my first season I grew butternut squash on this nice. and off of two plants I harvested 50 squash <laughs> yeah so it was like really intense everyone I knew wow. was eating squash they were like do you still have squash I'm like yeah, obviously yes I do <laughs> for like a amazing. year I was eating them that's, that's actually another good one to grow because yeah. The hard squash, they last so long. Storage. They're, you don't need a can, nothing. That's mm -hmm. natural storage. Yeah, right. I, I literally ate one almost a year later. Wow. With and it was just still like, good? Yep. Wow. And then you can also freeze it and stuff, and that'll last a long time, too. Right. But um, That's great. Okay. Yeah, so then with the soil, um, I started with the... I started reading about gardening a little bit, and so I was um, really interested in the square foot gardening method. And so I read that and I wanted to um, replicate part of it. Can you tell us about that? What is it? So the square foot gardening method is um, um, written by a person that I can't <laughs> remember his name right now. But he we'll was a up. he was an engineer. It's like one of the if you're like an avid gardener, it's one of the like most famous methods that people usually start with. Um, so he started, at, or his career was an engineer, and then when he retired, he wanted to get into gardening, and then of course looked at it through the eyes of an engineer. And so he wanted to figure out a way, you know, to grow the most amount of food in the smallest amount of space. And so the ideas behind it are um, optimizing every square footage of your garden to get the most out of it. And you, if you use this soil mixture, you really only need like four to six inches of soil. So also if you're in like a city area like this, the first like four to six inches of the top soil can be really contaminated with heavy metals um, from pollution. So if you build uh, a bed like this, it doesn't necessarily have to be raised, but just to have this wood about this much and fill it, that's pretty much all you need. Um, and then you're, you're allowing enough nutrients in those four to six inches that the roots will stay around there rather than going deeper. And, so did, um, you, did you get rid of some topsoil before you put that layer down? I did. Like um, the first four to six inches? Yeah, but I would recommend just building on top because um, the reason I did that is I felt okay. This had already been gardened for a while, so it wasn't just um, like city soil. Uh, the, you really don't want to dig up that city soil because it's not necessarily a problem to grow stuff in it. But as you kick up the dust and inhale it, that's how you ingest yeah, the heavy right. metals. Okay. So um, that's really why I like growing raised beds and just putting it on top of wherever it is gotcha. is best in the city. Gotcha. So um, yeah, I did remove some of it just to give me some more space. 
Okay. And um, I used a mixture of perlite, which you see a lot of it in yeah. here because it kind of, it's really, really light. So it tends to essentially like float up to the top. Yeah, yeah. But that's the purpose of it. So you can keep your soil really um, light and airy. So like, right. even though I haven't been watering it and it's been here for a while, I can like easily dig into it. Right. And that's the best thing that you Doesn't can do. Compacted. Exactly. You don't want to have super compacted soil. Um, so I did perlite, compost, um, some manure, and what was the third one? It's like three different parts: perlite, compost, and um, peat moss. Nice. Okay. Yeah. So like that was his like magic mixture, and. Uh, to be honest, it was a bit expensive um, for somebody who's a student, um, on, like on a very, very low budget. But, you know, if, like I said, if you put that investment in, which is really the idea behind it, yeah. it's really true. Um, yeah, the soil is your, your bank. Exactly. That's your, right. Yeah, so then I also have um, a very spider webby vermiculture bin here. Nice. So how did, did you make this yourself? I did. Right. So, and storage um, containers? Yeah. Also another like really cheap thing that you can do. So do both gloves this time because there's going to be lots of spiders and whatnot in here because again I don't really keep this up a lot and this is again like a testament to how easy it can be to do these things. If right. you're not trying to, you know, be perfect right. and you just want to have food growing, you just want to do your part, you just want to compost, yeah. you know, it doesn't have to be that hard. Right, so that's I have, crucial. Yeah. So I have my um, top bin here where I just started adding more food and, um, and dry stuff. And then this is a lot more composted in here by my worms. That's good. Let's see. There's actually some roots growing in here because I haven't done much to it. You can see a lot of eggshells and whatnot and baby worms, which is good. means that they're, uh, yeah, but, um, yeah, so it's a good start. Um, you can definitely, it definitely could be better, but I still use this and, um, it seems to do very, like pretty well. So how do you use it? What's your compost application method out here? Um, People have told me just like when you're replanting, put like a handful of it in the hole that you build and like water it so that it will like disperse a bit. And then you mix it in with some of your topsoil. Yeah. Okay. So nothing like too serious. Sometimes I'll kind of like sprinkle it around and then just water over there and then lay seeds or whatever. Okay. Um, and then it, the liquid collects down here. Nice. For the tea, and then I have a little hose, which nice. obviously have it emptied in a while. It's but there's still there's enough. still babies in there. There's so still something alive. Yeah. They've been getting wa enough water. Yeah. So again, this is my worm bin that has been seriously seriously neglected for months, and the worms are still alive. Wow. I was really worried that, like, when I first started it, that keeping it outside, the worms would die from the yeah. heat. And so again, a testament to like how sturdy <laughs> nature yeah, life, is. Life wants to live. Yeah, exactly. So, um, and and again, like I put in a lot of effort before what you're seeing right now. Right. So it was that that in uh, initial investment right. that really gave these things the strength to hold on despite right. my neglect. A solid four to six inches of good topsoil. Yeah. So. Taking care of the soil and then the sage is doing great. Yeah, sage and mint. You can mint. always grow that here. Yeah, so anything not do so well with the dryness and heat. Um I have let's see. We've got I a good list of the pros going already. Let me run through them. Artichoke, kale, fennel, nopal, um, tomatoes, sage. Well, I have some lavender over there that's really happy too. Lavender, rosemary. Mm -hmm. And um, sunflowers. All sunflowers. And those propagate everywhere too. Yeah. Um, and what do, you, what do you do with the sunflowers? 
the sunflowers. I just enjoy them. It's pretty. Yeah, those ones are pretty small. Some people in here do grow the big ones and save the seeds from them. But these ones I just love. Sunflowers are my favorite flower, so it just makes me happy. And nice. this year, especially, actually, like a few weeks ago when I drove in, it looks a lot of like a lot of the sunflowers are starting to droop. But a few weeks ago, I drove in and it was just everywhere. It was really pretty. Mm. They're a bit invasive to us, but yeah. you know, for the few months that they're growing, like right. they're so nice. And mulching. That's yeah. <laughs> oh, I also have a little pomegranate tree growing over oh, here. Oh, what? Oh, right there. Yeah, yeah so this, this guy actually um, was rehabbed from a friend who works at Grocery Outlet, and they, mm. um, he brought it over to me, and it was essentially dead. He's like, do you want it? I'm like, yeah, we'll see. Right. And that was a few years ago. Um, it just had, because pomegranates take a few years, and obviously it's in a pot. We're not supposed to plant trees here oh, because really? it's not permanent, permanent land right. mm -hmm. for us. So um, I keep it in the pot, and this year it started to flower for the first time. So nice. Good. They Very usually cool. take a few years to mature. Okay. No fruit yet, but I that have was a, a good sign. I have a moringa for you to adopt if you want in the car. Ooh, interesting. Yeah. Very interesting. If you're a, if you're a, a plant refuge of last resort, what do they call it? A, a, a rescue shelter. Yeah, that <laughs> might. Um, might motivate me to get back in here yeah this cactus i think is the main reason That's i've been gorgeous. like afraid to come back though because it's going to be a lot of work oh uh, i would take some of those uh, yeah some of those leaves i'd love to start some yeah yeah for sure just if to you're going to eat started. any of the ones you take wash them super well Definitely. because even i took some a few weeks ago and washed them and they seemed like you know i took them from the top area away from the flowers and mm. I just pulled them out of my basket earlier and got spikes all in my hand, so oh, they're, they're yeah. very painful. <laughs> right. Yeah. They also teach me the technique. Yeah, gloves. Gloves, latex. Yeah, latex. Well, it's that's all for the about fruits. That. I got you. So this um, this cactus, I was really disappointed that the flowers were not fruiting, and I was having a hard time finding online any information about that. And I think what I've come to find is this particular variety, they just don't fruit. So that was really disappointing. Um, if you do want a prickly pear that fruits, um, there are some spineless varieties. This one's a spineless variety, they say. So the spines here are soft and they just come right off like that. Mm. Um, what you really have to worry about are these little... Um, I really wish I could, like, the word is right there. There's, like, a word for them. It's not nodule. Little, little it's, like, stabbers. something like that. Yeah, they're, like, they they like, little splinters. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so are the leaves good, then, on this one, though? Are yes. they're, they're Yeah. They so, look delicate. Yeah, so the Nepalis are, like, perfectly, the pads, they call them, are, like, perfectly fine to eat. Um, just this particular variety, you're not going to get prickly pear fruit, which was super disappointing. Yeah. But, that one um, up there looks pretty good, or is that the That's actually what I got it from. That's not the same variety, got you. Yeah, okay, so good same variety. I think I, um, yeah, I started propagating a fruiting kind, but it's at home. Okay. But that one will go in the garden once it's better, because I did really want the, the pears. Yeah, the tunas are good. So good. But the nopales are good too, uh, or the, um, the pads. Yeah. I, let's see. I chopped them up raw and chopped up jicama mm. and then um, left it in like um, lime juice and and salt for like a day and it was really good so that was like one that good sounds far yeah and then I you know there's lots of ways you can cook them and stuff okay. too but you can eat them raw also. have you ever grown jicama no it's like a huge root I think yeah right? yeah they get so big have you grown it? No, I'm curious though. Yeah. I'm gonna keep asking around. <laughs> so the lavender that you have here, you just said was propagated. So yeah. that means you took a cutting, right? Mm -hmm. And then what did you do? So I actually took the cutting from my mom's house up in the Bay Area and then I drove down. So it was out like for a while before I actually planted it. And it was pretty long. Like these are still really, short stems it was a fairly long stem 
Um, you clean the leaves off of most of the bottom, and I actually used a, um, a root powder, which you could buy like at Home Depot. It's really inexpensive. Like but, a hormone? Yeah, rooting hormone. So um, with lavender, I read that that was the best way because I guess it's more difficult to propagate. And now I just use it for whatever I'm propagating if I'm not sure how well it's going to propagate just to give it an extra boost. Or if I'm rehabbing a plant that's having a difficult time rooting, you can just dip it in the powder and it'll help it to root better. So dip it in the powder um, and then put it in the dirt and just be patient with it. And I have a bush now. That's rad. Yeah, so... Do you water it extra at the beginning? Not too much. Um, with propagations, what you want to do is you want to give it enough water for it to sense that there's water. Um, for it to start sending its hormones to produce roots but you don't want to give it so much water that you rot the bottom of it because it doesn't have the root system to soak up the water so if it gets too wet and there's no roots to suck it up there it'll just rot in that contact point so you kind of have to feel out how much you water a propagation at first but I think once you get used to it, once you start propagating a lot, you just can kind of tell from a feel of the soil or looking at it. And I think it's better to lean towards not enough water than too much. Because a lot of people have the problem of um, watering too much, loving too much. And um, if it's not getting enough water, it will tell you. Like you'll know when it's ready to be watered because it's gonna droop so I tend to lean towards obviously not watering enough. That's rad though it's really it's really helpful to know especially we got a shortage of the water out here we've got generally any kind of like hard leafed herbs like the rosemary and stuff does pretty well um, I think like oregano you're gonna do really well stuff like that as far as vegetables Summertime is a little hard because it does get so hot here, but in the winter in California, that I would say is the best season to grow because just a little bit of rain here and there, if you've done your soil well, you can plant a whole garden like fairly easily with a lot of winter greens and stuff like that. You've heard it here, folks. It is now September. Start your winter gardens. Yes, actually now is a good time. It's just about the time when you want to start pulling out um, your tomatoes. Oh, which reminds me, eggplant. Uh, all the nightshades, mm. they do pretty well. Nice. Potatoes, actually. I just pulled mine out, which is why they're not in here, because I pulled them all out last week. Actually, never watered those. Wow. <laughs> I put, I, these this time I bought them from seed, so um, I've tried before, which you can do, and same with onions, is like cutting, uh, you know, taking the heart of it and then replanting it, hmm. um, which sometimes I'll do actually with my onions if they start to get bad. Um, I take off all the bad layers and then the, like the inside heart, I'll just really? plant it and then regrow it. Wow. Yeah, it's just kind of like fun to do I that. That's possible, that's awesome. Yeah, and then, um, you know, you can eat the greens the whole time it's growing and then eventually eat the bulb. Hmm. Onions are a little difficult to grow in California, in Southern California, because we actually have short days here um, compared to places where onions grow really well. So you have to look for, if you want to do onions well, you need to get a short day variety. So if you if you grow the ones from the grocery store, likely what you'll get, um, the benefit you're gonna get is the green onions from the, just cutting the leaves off. And then maybe in a few years, you'll have a bulb. They grow really slow. But um, potatoes, those grow pretty well. You can cut up a potato as long as each cut has an eye on it, um, like a spot where it will start to root, you know, when you leave it out too long. Um, like you could take one potato, cut it up five, six times, plant it and get five or six potato plants. Wow. Yeah, although um, I have had difficulty. This is where GMOs come in, where it's kind of a problem with- um, You don't wanna just plant anything. Yeah, and uh, like a lot, of, a lot of plants are, or the seeds are engineered now, so the, they will only produce one generation. Um, so with some of the store-bought potatoes I've had, they haven't produced 
Um, so this time I did buy them from seed and they did pretty well. I watered them the one time when I planted them and then uh, I came back and harvested them. They were small, but they all grew, which was really cool to see. Um, and yeah, you can get lucky sometimes. Like the butternut squash that I grew, actually the seeds came from a store-bought squash, which I, I told a farmer that and they were shocked. So like, it's, it's often that if you take seeds from store-bought um, plants, if you're not getting them from a farm, like a sustainable, farm um, it's likely that they've been modified so that they won't grow another generation or the next generation might have um, some kind of deformity the fruits might not be right or something so you kind of have to be careful there if you're if you're taking seeds from what you're eating but you can definitely propagate um, onions potatoes celery which I um, have grown pretty successfully by propagating take off one stalk or replant the whole thing or so you know just cut off the root end yeah. um you can you some people put it in water in the kitchen until the roots grow and then plant it um i'll cut off the root end and just put it straight in the dirt but whenever you're propagating you want to water more often than i'm watering here mm -hmm. you know so keep it keep it moist enough like i said so that it will um get the roots to grow uh you can also propagate um lettuce like whenever you get a um, like a vegetable that has a root end, you can cut off that root end and propagate it. Right. Actually, pineapple too. I've been really interested in yeah. starting. You can propagate pineapple as well. Yeah, I've got a couple of those successfully going. Oh, nice. It was, it was relatively easy. That's awesome. Yeah. I was going to give you this if you want to grow right. a lot of Please, yes. Yeah. So what, yeah. what do I do? Pull out the little hairs in each Yeah, one? so... Each one of those is a seed. Yeah, so actually last time I was here, I kind of like threw them around. So we'll see what comes up. Red. So I have a bunch of amaranth seeds, uh, some green and some red. Uh, oh, yeah. If you'd like yeah, to do another scatter. The red is rampant. It's not growing right now. Oh, you um, have some? I pulled some out nice. recently. But yeah, it will come back as soon as it rains. It's going to be everywhere. Red. <laughs> yeah. You eat it? Um, I, tr you know what? I didn't before because I just learned that the leaves are edible. Oh. Okay. Um, How much do one of these plots cost per square foot? Is it just a per plot basis? And what's the arrangement? Yeah, so um, for the Long Beach organic plots, um, the plots I think are like, what is it? It's a hundred. It's like $40 a plot, I think, for six months. It's very inexpensive. So I actually have two plots. Each one of these squares is its own here. Nice. Um, and I pay $105 every six months. Um, what it is? Yeah, I believe so, for every six months. So, so. it's like... 20 bucks a month maybe total for you but the, yeah and that's for two plots right. so um there is a 25 dollar um fee for the organization per year so total i so i pay 105 and then it's like i pay 185 dollars a year um so 25 of that is just a one-time fee and then it's 80 dollars each one is 40 dollars every six months so um that's all for the fees it's very inexpensive because you can really grow so much food and a lot of the food that i've grown like artichokes when i'm harvesting them when they're they're happy i'm getting like 10 or 20 artichokes and those are expensive vegetables things like that um you know people here are growing asparagus things that are really expensive to buy at the store or even you know everything can be very expensive yeah totally um especially when you're tomatoes, growing yeah. it fully organic and sustainable all that right. stuff so um there's that and then there's an agreement for a certain amount of community service hours so um we do they do um normally non-covid times they have like a work party once a month where they open up the garden and everyone comes for a few hours and you just help clear like the walkways um you know whenever they're building new new infrastructure around or something we help do that 
and you just need to do six hours every six months so basically if you want to come to like two Saturdays then you're done and they allow you to bring friends and family members to help make up those hours too so right. it's pretty um it's pretty reasonable that's super low key, yeah. yeah it makes it fairly easy um you do have to uh keep your walkways clear which mine is not right now because they have been letting it go because of the pandemic for you know those reasons you know you pandemic to, you times have, have been your weird right. <laughs> but normally um at least six inches out you need to keep clear because it just reduces the spread of the weeds to everybody right you know so um that's i think the only other really real requirement um as far as like work-wise that you have to do to be able to stay in here otherwise yeah just keep up your plot better than what i'm doing right now <laughs> nah, you're, you did a great experiment for us yeah we learned what thrives in neglect in southern california dry and hot weather um and yeah. we've got yeah we've got all these great food producing plants that just did really well mm -hmm. um without much care so that means you can grow them too even if you don't think you have a green thumb throw some fennel in the ground get some artichokes in the ground get some kale in the ground get some nopales going get some herbs some drought hardy herbs those tomatoes are amazingly bright and vibrant so, yeah. yeah and if you actually water like eggplant once a great. week right. you'll you could grow so much more because like, right. they're before the really hot months there was actually quite a lot more growing which was surprising um yeah and it, again the soil that's the big kicker Good i think that, did, that really helped my garden from just dying off completely was the soil mm -hmm. all right you heard it first here let's take a look around the rest of the safaria junction community garden big dino looking kale trees the red kale tomatoes growing over some something else some berries it looks like Pumpkins, huge sunflowers, carrots, basil, tomatoes. The basil looks like it's struggling getting heat burn or something. Tomatoes are all looking super good. Lavender's all looking great everywhere. The peas looking all right. Looking all right, pretty good with the peas. Tomatoes popping off. It is the season. Squash and pumpkins, look at them. Really healthy looking. Kale, squash, corn over there. All right, I don't know if they have plots available, but. Looks like these might be some potentially available plots to our intrepid soul who might wanna clean that up. This is so cool. I'm glad you're enjoying it. Yeah. It's like, like I said, it's like an oasis away from the city. Totally. And in the winter when it's, there's regular rain, you know, and uh, usually when it's not, when COVID is not happening. Right. Um, you know, I think that's really kept a lot of people out of the garden lately. Um, some people have been able to come a lot more because of that but you know there's a lot of people who are at risk or you know dealing with a lot more at home now that haven't been able to come as much but normally especially during the winter it's just lush and beautiful and quiet and super peaceful i see a lot of varieties of species here which is really nice to see because we generally don't see a lot of wildlife around um, but you know we have a lot of the skunks and whatnot they're very happy around here um i've seen some like huge lizards in here which is really cool um i saw like very scary but saw a tarantula hawk here before wow. which was like terrifying but um it's pretty cool to you know to have that space in the middle of like such a such a very compacted area right it's people are living so densely here and so to have this green space is such a gift. It 
and there's a there's a really good sense of community too because you know we see each other here a lot and we come and we work on the plots and you see people's gardens growing and you know you get to know people you know their personal lives and then you know them over years because you you've been gardening with them so long and there's a lot of um you know a lot of nice sense of community there too i found um actually a lot like had career opportunities made friends you know learned new hobbies all kinds of things from people that i've met at the garden so it's really I know it's like healthy to say, but it's like you're not just growing your own food, but you're really like growing yourself, <laughs> you know, and your community and everything. I can, you know, I could write a kid's book <laughs> about the, the wonders of community gardening. It's, That's right. yeah, and everyone who gardens here feels the same, you know, you, you have this really biological connection to earth that we often ignore um you know living our busy lives and uh this is a great example of me having some time where i've ignored it but every time you come here and you put your hands in the dirt it just triggers something in you you know it, it's very calming it's great for your mental health it's great for your physical health you know and then you're producing food that you can be very proud of and also feel very good eating because you know exactly where it came from, all the work that went into it. You know. Yeah, studies have shown that kids involved with um, food production in any way with their families are gonna grow up to be healthier because they know where their food comes from. You know, whether that's cooking with their parents or especially um, working in the gardens, you know. They, they become so much more adventurous um, with trying new things. I remember being, you know, a kid averse to vegetables, but I see kids running around her all the time and they get so excited to try anything. You know, you just pull something out of the ground and they're like, whoa, and they want to eat it. You know, it's really cool to see that. And they get so excited um, about growing the food and just being out here and stuff. And it's definitely true for adults too, you know, you're going to eat a lot more vegetables if you grew it because you know the effort that you put into it for one and then also it feels like I don't know like there's part of you in it that's right yeah it's clean it's beautiful it's lovely <laughs> Thank you.